Oh, I'm excited this morning. I'm excited. Um, I'm excited for what God is doing in you. I'm excited for not just what has happened over this weekend, but I'm excited for where you're positioned and where God is taking you. And I believe there's a, an acceleration in life coming into Catch the Fire Boulder like never before, strength coming into you, joy coming into you. And um, we're just thrilled. It's our honor and privilege to be a small part of that. Uh, I was a little bit surprised when we were chatting with Stephen Christie and he asked me to preach for the next five hours, but I'm going to do my best to honor that. <laughs> Just want to let you know. So we're going to start at Genesis and go all the way through to Revelation. Um, so, so get ready. Um, but as, as I was preparing for this morning, I actually had about seven or eight different messages and I was going, Lord, what, which one are you really highlighting? And as we were chatting and praying about it, uh, I really want to talk to you this morning about the eternal plans and purposes of God for your life. I want to talk about the calling of God for your life because from the beginning of time, he knew you. And he didn't just know you. He knew what he was going to do in you. He knew where you were going to be. He knew that on this day, uh, Sunday, March 15th, 2020, that you would be sitting here. And he's seen the rest of your life, where you've come from, where you are, and where you're going. And sometimes in the middle of that, what, we can, what can happen is we can lose faith and we can lose hope because we don't know where we're going. We don't see what's coming up. And so this morning, I felt like the Lord was releasing fresh hope into you. He was releasing fresh courage into you for those of you who are discouraged. He's releasing fresh grace into your life to accomplish what he has already called you to do. And so we're going to jump into that. So if you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, we're going to look at the life of Joseph. Uh, please turn with me to Genesis. Genesis 37. While you're turning there, uh, it has just been such a great honor to get to know some of your leadership team. You guys just have phenomenal, phenomenal leaders who love you with all of their hearts, who pray for you, who are there to support you. And um, for just for a minute, I'd like us to honor your leaders. So if you're on the eldership team or if, uh, you're a pastor here, sorry, what's that? Elders or deacons, can I get you just to stand up where you are for a minute? Yeah. And, that's right. Wait, no, 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 stay standing. What I'd like you to do, stay standing. What I'd like you to do is if you are around someone who's standing up, I'd like you to stand up and go to them right now. I'd like you to go to them and just put your hands on their shoulders, and we're going to take a moment as a church family to honor them and to pray for them. And so if you know them, feel free to give them a hug. Feel free to give them a kiss. Feel free to uh, tell them how much you love them and appreciate them. But in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you for the powerful men and women here. We thank you for their hearts to serve you. We thank you for their hearts to hear you. We thank you for their hearts to love those around them. And in Jesus' name, we speak strength and life into you. We ask, God, that your courage and your wisdom and your power would come upon our friends and leaders in even greater ways and measures. Abba, we thank you for doors that you're opening for them that no man can open. We thank you for doors that you are shutting that no man can shut. And we thank you that you are in charge and that you are leading them on and drawing them closer and deeper to you. And so I just want you, over your leaders right now, just say more. More Holy Spirit. More, Lord. Come on, say it like you mean it. Say it like you would want to be prayed for. More, Lord. More of your power. More of your love. More of your grace. More of your strength. More, Lord. Yes, Lord. We say amen. 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 Give them a hug. Give them a fist bump. Give them your kids. Go out for a date night. I mean, I'm just saying... We're going to look at the life of Joseph, and we're going to look at the life of Joseph because he is a pattern, he is a model of how God works in our lives and what God has called us into. So for those of you who, um, for those of you who come from, uh, who have been trained classically in preaching, I have a three-point sermon. 
But my three-point sermon is really an amalgamation of like a five-part series. And so we're just going ju- to jump in. Uh, uh, Genesis 37, we're going to start at, at verse 5. See, Genesis is, ta- is tech- talking to us about the plans of God. Genesis is talking to us about what God is doing for humanity. And we start seeing this family now who God has chosen out of the, all the face of the earth. And we see this young man named Jacob, and Jacob starts to have children, and Jacob has ten sons, and then he has one more. And the one son that he has is named Joseph, and Jacob favors Joseph over all others. Jacob gives him a coat of many colors. Jacob uh, gives his son preferential treatment. Jacob listens to his son. Even though he's the youngest, he listens to his son to the exclusion of some of his older brothers. And so as a result, his brothers resent him. His brothers are holding this against him. And Joseph is a young man. Actually, let's be honest. He's probably a young boy. And it says here, Genesis 37, verse 5, now Joseph had a dream. There was something that happened where Joseph began to dream about the things that God had for him when he was older. When he's younger, he begins to get a glimpse of it. And it says, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. The sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. What's beginning to happen? Joseph is beginning to understand and see what God has called him to. He's getting a vision. He's getting an idea that this is what I'm supposed to do. He has no idea what it's going to look like, actually. All he knows is that the out, in the outworking of the dream, his brothers and his father are bowing down to him. In Jewish culture, this is one of the most arrogant things you could say. Because you are meant to... Uh, revere your elders. You're meant to respect your leaders. You're meant to respect your father and mother, not have them bow down to you. And Joseph begins to catch a small glimpse of his future. And what begins to happen is his chest begins to puff up. Listen to his words. He says, listen to the dreams that I have dreamed. Who's the emphasis on? It's on Joseph. Why? Because He knows that he's born for greatness. I don't know anyone when they're younger who dreams of mediocrity. I don't know of anyone who is saying, I'm hoping I can just get by, live paycheck to paycheck, and when I pass, no one will know my name. When you're younger, you dream of being astronauts, firefighters, policemen. You dream of being politicians. You dream of being the next president of the United States. Why is that? It's because God has already spoken a word over your life, and the word of God that he has spoken is designed for greatness. God has put greatness inside of your hearts. God has not called you to mediocrity. He's not called you to live a life where you're just getting by. He's not called you to live a life where where you are not impacting the world. He's called you for greatness. From the beginning of time, he saw you, and he was pleased. And he spoke a word over you. And the word of God that he spoke over you is the very word that will cause greatness to rise up inside of you. And so I would like you to turn to your neighbor and look them in the eye and say, you were born for greatness. You were made for greatness. Now turn to your second choice, the neighbor that you didn't turn to the first time, and look them in the eye and say, no, 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 you were born for greatness. You were made for greatness.
<laughs> because the word that God speaks comes true. And the word God has spoken over us is for greatness. I don't know anyone who dreams of being mediocre. And there are some of us in this room when you were younger, you were thinking, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to impact the world. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to change lives. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And the dreams that we begin to dream are actually from God. There are the things that he has placed inside of you that he is bringing up. And in his goodness, he has put his power and his purpose inside of you because the world needs what you're carrying. So let me ask you this. What are those things that he has started to put inside of your life? See, Joseph has no idea. He's a young boy at this point. He doesn't know what the outworking of it is going to look like. All he knows is that that is what I'm going to do one day. For some of you, we don't see the what, we don't see the how, but we know the why. We begin to hear God say that you will, be, you will preach, you will teach. We begin to hear God say you will lead companies. We begin to hear God say that you want to impact lives. You want to change the world. And that hunger for greatness, I want to tell you, is from the Lord. That desire for greatness is from him. In fact, it says in Psalm 1835, David writes this, and he says that your gentleness makes me great. Other translations say you stoop down to make me great. Your humility makes me great. God is interested in making you great. You are not born for mediocrity. The story goes on. Joseph is kind of a brat. He's a little bit spoiled. And he, his father keeps him with him while all of the other brothers are sent out to do the hard work of past, pasturing the flocks, of uh, taking care of the herds. And so Joseph uh, is rude towards his brothers and tells on them frequently to his father. And so his father sends Joseph to go check on them. And Joseph starts follow, following them. He, uh, he goes somewhere. They're not there. He asks around, find, finds out that they're in a different town. And so, and so he goes to find them. And while he's on his way to see them, his brothers are looking and they see him coming. And they say, here is that dreamer. Here is that one. This is our opportunity. And so when Joseph arrives, the very brothers, his own flesh and blood, they take him, they strip him off his robes, and they throw him into a pit. And then these Midianite traders come along and they sell him to these traders who take him to Egypt. And there we see that they became the original Trader Joes. Um, <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine sharing the dreams with the people around you that God has put on your heart? And sometimes the very people that you share the dreams with are the very people that begin to say, who do you think you are? There's no way you're going to do that. There's no way you're going to become that. And Joseph was taken and thrown into a pit and then sold to traders where his hands were bound and his feet were bound and he was dragged behind a camel to Egypt. Can you imagine having being in this hot desert behind the camel, being forced to run as fast as you can on the hot sand and if you fall, you would most likely get whipped and dragged. Day after day after day, the smell of the camel, the smell of the traders, the smell of yourself, the smell of the camels, the smell of the tra traders, the smell of yourself, the sun beating down on you, you're parched, you're thirsty, you're hungry, and all the time you're moving further and further away from where you were comfortable. All the time you're going further and further away from your dreams. And you get to Egypt and you're sold as a slave. You're put into slavery. And the person that you begin to serve works for the Pharaoh.
What do you do? You're away from everything familiar you've known. You don't even speak the language. You don't eat the food. This is foreign to you. You grew up in tents. You're now in a house. You're used to pasturing flocks and moving around. And now for the first time in your life, you're staying still for an extended period of time. And if you're Joseph, you're probably seeing the death of your dreams. You're probably seeing it go into the ground and die. There's no way. There's no way that you are ever going to be able to see the fulfillment of the sheaves and the sun and the moon and the stars bowing down to you. There's no way it's ever going to happen. You're so far removed. But... But maybe, just maybe, if you work hard, maybe if you apply yourself, maybe if you're full of passion, you can build a new life for yourself. And that's what he begins to do. He begins to apply himself. And Potiphar, the captain of Pharaoh's guard, sees this, and he begins to promote him. He promotes him over his entire household. It says this, Genesis 39, verse 1 to 4. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. I think when I look across America that people let go of the dreams that they had in order to be comfortable. People go, if I work hard, if I do this, I'm going to be comfortable. And that is okay. Because what I thought I was going to do when I was younger is never going to happen. I'm in a different land. I'm I'm with different people. And these people don't believe in me. So, I'm just going to work for myself. I'm going to build for myself. I'm going to build for my family. And it seems like Joseph is starting on the right path. He has favor, and he has favor with an influential person. And because he has so much favor with this influential person, it says that Joseph is handsome and good-looking. And I did say that was Joseph that was not describing Steve. I know some of you may think that, but that is all right. Joseph as well was handsome and good looking. And pretty soon Potiphar's wife begins to notice this young Jewish boy with the chiseled good looks. And she begins to want to sleep with him. And yet Joseph fears the Lord and fears his master. He says, I could not do such a wicked thing. I could not do such a evil thing and he refuses and she tries to seduce him and he he leaves his robe and runs out of the house and she is left with this robe and she waits and I can see her going oh just wait till my husband gets home I am going to tell him I'm going to make Joseph pay and Potiphar comes home and she makes up this entire story about how he tried to rape her how he tried to force himself on her And I think there's a part of Potiphar that does not believe her because he's the captain of the guard and he could have had Joseph killed. He could have killed him himself. He was his slave. There's no police around. There's no court system. He is the court system. And yet what he does is he takes Joseph and he throws him into the deepest, darkest dungeon where all the king's prisoners go. Now, this isn't jail. This is the dungeon. This is rats running around. This is you're in a hole. There's no sunlight. This is a stinks of feces, stinks of uh, urine. There's barely anything to eat. And this is the hole that Joseph gets thrown into. Can you imagine? What if that was you? What would you be thinking? God, where are you? God, I tried to honor you. God, I could have slept with her, but I didn't. And look where it's got me. God, why am I here? 
God, what about the dreams? What about the things that you said over my life? The first point, God has spoken a word for, over your life. And that very word has designed for greatness. Point number two, for those of you taking notes, is the very word of the Lord that God has spoken over you is the very word that is going to attract trial and difficulty and hardship in order that the word may be tested. Because it says in Psalm 105, 19, that Joseph went ahead of them. His feet were put in fetters until the word of the Lord tested him. Until what he had said came to pass. The very word of God that he has spoken over your life is the very word that is going to attract trouble and difficulty and hardship. And there are some of you in this room that you are so discouraged and so hopeless because you started off, you thought you heard from God, and you, you're looking for what is going to come. And now you're in the process and you're in the journey towards it, and it seems like all hell is breaking loose. And more than that, Joseph is not just being attacked, he's being forgotten. He gets thrown into the deep, dark pit where no one sees him. No one knows his name. No one cares. He has no advocate. He has no lawyer. He has no rights. And that's where some of you find yourselves. What started off with such great promise and such great hope has crashed. Your business has gone bankrupt. The things that you thought you'd be doing are falling flat. The people who were once your friends are not turning their backs on you. Or they're speaking evil against you. And you're saying, God, where are you? Why have you forgotten me? God, I don't understand. What you don't understand is that the very word of God is still being active and fruitful in your life. And you think that the darkness around you is the darkness of the tomb. But what if it's not the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb? Because here's the thing, is that Jesus primes us for resurrection life. How many of you want resurrection life to flood into your body and flood into your mind? Well, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. And remember this. There is no resurrection without death. There's no resurrection without death. So if you're going to die, please die quickly. Don't drag it out. Don't draw it out. When I was younger, I, I was forced. I was forced to watch Bollywood movies. Not Hollywood, Bollywood. This is different. This is like four hours of singing and dancing. Terrible acting. If you don't believe me, I'll watch one with no, I won't watch one with I will recommend one for you to watch. Here's what here's what invariably happens. Um, in the in the Bollywood movie. And there's a hero and there's a girl, and they're going to get together, but then they can't get together. And at some point, the hero gets shot quite dramatically and quite badly. And he goes, oh, oh. And then somehow, he manages to travel to three different cities, uh, sing two dance numbers, dance in the rain, dance behind a tree. And then finally, he gets to the love of his life, and he's just about to kiss her, and then he dies. Don't be a Bollywood actor. Please, tell your neighbor this. Do not do that. Do not be a Bollywood actor. Don't drag your death out. If you're going to die, die quickly. Lay it down. The dreams that you've been holding on to, stop holding on to them. Plant them. Let go of them. Release them. Because it's not up to you anyway. See, what Joseph did during this time, if you are in this place, if you feel like you're in the prison, people have forgotten you, you're in the darkness, you're in the dank sweat and urine and feces with rats running around, you're just asked to do one thing. And that is keep your heart sweet to the Lord. Keep your heart searching after his presence. Let your roots go deep into him. And I know that Joseph th 
did this. And the reason I know is because God was still with him. It says in Genesis 39, 19, As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me. His anger was kindled. Joseph's master took him, put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But, everyone say but. But the Lord. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever the Lord and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. It's not you, it's God. It's not you, it's him. You know, I was, I was kind of in this, I was in this place when I was younger. I was getting so frustrated. Felt like I had all this potential. Nothing was happening. I didn't know where I was going to be. I didn't know what I was going to do. But I was frustrated. And one day I was praying. I was saying, Lord, I give up. I just give up. Lord, what do you want to say to me? What do you want to say to me in this place of discouragement? What do you want to say to me in this place of hopelessness? What do you want to say to me in, the, in this place of depression? And I heard the Lord in his goodness come alongside of me. I felt like his arm just come around me, and he whispered in my ear, John, I have a big butt. And I went, get behind me, Satan. I'm trying to hear from the Lord. <laughs> Lord, that sounds really weird. Lord, what do you want to say to me? And I hear him say again, John, I have a big butt. Because you've disqualified yourself. You've talked about why you failed. You've talked about what you've messed up. You've talked about how you feel frustrated. You talk about all this hopelessness. But you've forgotten about my grace. You've forgotten that in that place, I have grace for you. And my grace is the huge butt of your life. Joseph is in prison, but God. But God is with him. But God is showing favor to him. But God is releasing strength into him. But God, and over each one of you, God has a big butt for your life. Turn to your neighbor. Come on, I'm going to make you do this. Turn to your neighbor, look them in the eye, and tell them God's got a big butt for you. God's got a big butt for you. He's got a big butt. And when I look back over my life, and I look at the cross, I think that's the, that's the biggest intervention in human history. We were dead in our sin. We were dead in our hopelessness. We were dead in shame and pain and fear. We had transgressed God. We were dead in pride. But Jesus died for us. And Jesus took you and took me and brought us into himself. And, and when he died, we died. And when he was buried, we were buried. And when he was raised, we were raised. And when he ascended, we ascended. This is why Paul over and over and over again says that you are in Christ Jesus. You have been seated in Christ because the cross, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the big butt of God over all of humanity. And I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful this morning for the grace of Jesus that has come into my life, that has changed me and transformed me, that has not kept me in the darkness of the prison, but has brought me into the resurrection into the power of resurrection. See, the very word of God that he's spoken over you for greatness is the very word that will test you. It's the very word that will attract trial and difficulty and persecution and hardship into your life because God is not interested in raising and making you great. He's interested in making his son Jesus great through you. He's not interested in making you a better person. He's interested in killing your old self and raising you up into the newness of his life so that Jesus can shine through you. 
And that is why the hardship and the trials and the difficulty have got to come into our life because we've got to understand that the word of God that he spoke over us is not about us. It's about him and his purposes and what he's doing. See, while Joseph's there, he thinks that's going to be his life. He thinks that's the end. But God doesn't. Joseph's doing everything he can to get out. He interprets the dream of the cupbearer and the baker. He tells them, please remember me. Cupbearer, when you're restored to your position, tell Pharaoh about me. Let me go. Let me out of here. And the cupbearer forgets about him for two more years. Until one day Pharaoh has a dream that no one can interpret. And then the cupbearer goes, ah. There is a young Hebrew. And Pharaoh says, quickly bring him to me. And they bring Joseph out, and it says that they washed him. Why? He stank. He probably, when they brought him to the light, he was probably like, <sighs> because he had been in the darkness for so long. And they bring him before Pharaoh. Pharaoh goes, I have a dream. Can you interpret it for me? And Joseph goes, not I, but the Lord. See, during that time, Joseph had taken the spotlight off himself. And the Lord gave him the interpretation. And then Joseph, Joseph gave him the application. And for those of you who are prophetic, for those of you who hear from God, please don't ever take a word of wisdom with a word of knowledge without asking the Lord for the word of wisdom on how to apply it. Don't ever assume that just because God says something that you know how it's meant to be applied. See, this is what Joseph does, and as a result, he goes from being, he goes from the prison to the palace in one day. And one day, God turns around all of his fortunes. And one day, he goes from the prison to the palace, and he's ruling with the heart of a servant now. And on top of that, the king, Pharaoh changes his name. Pharaoh gives him an Egyptian name. Genesis 41, 45 says, Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphoneth Panea. I probably butchered that. It means the treasury of the glorious rest. There was something about Joseph where even though he had been through all this trial, all this rejection, all this persecution... He had found his rest in God, and the rest that he carried overshadowed him, and Pharaoh could see it on him. And Pharaoh goes, that is amazing. The things that your heart is meditating on, the things that you're letting your roots go deep into, will overshadow you. My prayer for you is that the peace and the joy and the grace that you carry begins to fill rooms and begins to fill companies and begins to fill your state and begins to fill the country because you're so rooted in him that you're unshakable down here. Eventually, what Joseph says comes to pass. They have seven years of good and then they end up with seven years of famine. His brothers come to him. His brothers travel to see him, and they don't recognize him. Because Joseph has appear, appears Egyptian. Joseph speaks Egyptian. His brothers don't recognize him. And he finally reveals himself to them. Genesis 45, verse 4 says this, as he reveals himself. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in this land for two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you for a remnant on earth and to keep you alive for many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. Over and over and over again now, who is Joseph talking about? He's not talking about Joseph. He's no longer that young bratty boy who was so focused on his dreams and what he wanted. He's now over here, and through the process of maturing and through the process of walking with the Lord, he's going, 
yeah, I'm actually, I'm not that great. But he is everything. And at the end of his life, he turns to his brothers. At the end of the book, he says, what you meant for evil, God has turned into good. See, through the pressure, through the trials, the thing that God is teaching us is that there is nothing any human can do to you that he will not turn for good. There's nothing that people will say about you that he will not turn for good. There's nothing that your, if your manager, if your boss at work is against you once you're gone, you can go in there confident with every assurance that, you, that they may try to do you harm and they may succeed in the short term, but your heavenly father is going to turn it for good. Your heavenly father is going to bring good out of it. And out of all the hurt and out of all the pain and out of all the brokenness and, discourage, and discouragement and hopelessness you've walked through, our Heavenly Father is going to bring good out of it so that the testimony of your lives impacts nations and generations. And in this room, while I was preparing and while I was praying, I felt like the Lord was saying, that there are some of you, you have started to let go of the dreams that he had placed into your heart. There's some of you, you're at the point where you go, I don't even know what dreams I have because you're, you've been so filled with hopelessness. You've been so filled with despair. And I hear the Lord saying over you, he has not forgotten you. He is with you. And he is releasing strength and courage into your life and into your heart. There are some of you who are going, John, that's not me. I am, I'm full of passion. I'm full of vigor. I'm full of dreams and excitements. Excitement. For you, remember this. That God has created you for greatness. But he's created you so that his son will, be sh will shine through you. So that his son will be made great through you. And when that becomes the cry of our lives, Jesus can be most glorified through us. That when the world sees us, they see him. When the world sees the compassion and the kindness and the love that we carry, they see him. That is where God is moving us to. And I believe, catch the fire boulder, that as you walk with him and as you hear his voice, as you are transformed by his love, that that will become so attractive to the people of Lafayette. That will become so attractive to the people of Boulder. That will become so attractive to the people of Denver. Because there's nothing like that anywhere else on earth. And my prayer for you is that you will be the most glorious, joy-filled, great people in the state of Colorado. Knowing your father, knowing his strength, and being thrown into what he has for you. Because he's calling all of us on the grand adventure to join him in his plans and purposes. If you're in this, if you're in this place and you don't know, you don't know what you're called to, I'm, I'm gonna ask you, the greatest thing you can do is serve. The greatest thing you can do is get plugged in. The greatest thing you can do is be forced to hear God's voice for someone else. I learned how to minister, I learned how to preach, I learned how to pray for people in kids' ministry for 10 years. Every, every week I would be surrounded by snotty-nosed kids. Every week I would be in the back. Every week no one knew who I was, and that was fine. But I learned how to pray for them. I learned how to hold them in my heart. I learned how to push through when it was tough. I learned how to put, I learned everything I know in ministry, in kids' ministry. The greatest thing you can do is begin to give your life away. Even when it's dark, even when it's difficult, even when it seems like you're lost, even when it seems like you don't know, because in serving others, you yourself will be served. Scripture says that he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And this morning, I feel like the Lord is releasing fresh hope He's releasing fresh dreams. Some of you, you, I see that you have had dreams in your hand and you have let them go. And the Lord is beginning to resurrect them. He's beginning to bring them back up. The dreams to serve him, the dreams to walk with him, the dreams to speak, preach, teach, to lead. 
the dreams to reach others. He's beginning to resurrect them. I'm going to ask you to stand up with me, please. three things we're going to do. I hear the Lord saying to bless the greatness that he's sown inside of you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we speak a blessing over you. We bless you to prosper. We bless your roots to go deep. We bless you to prosper financially, emotionally, relationally, spiritually, physically. We, we speak the blessing of God over your life and over your family that you would grow in him and be incredibly fruitful in the mighty name of Jesus. We bless you, catch the fire boulder, <laughs> to walk in the fulfillment of the dreams and the promises that God has spoken over your life. But there are some of you, as you walked in this morning, you have been full of discouragement, You've been full of hopelessness. You've been full of anxiety. And the Lord right now is coming to you. And he's beginning to pour, to put his arms around you and pour his liquid, hey, golden honey of grace and power into your life. And if that's you, I would like you to boldly come out of your seat and come up to the front because we want to pray for you. If that's you, come on up. There's no shame. We're family together. We're gonna have the ministry team come on up and and just begin just begin to start praying. And then I believe there's one more call, and that is for those of you in this room who want to see Jesus be made great through you. And if that's you, I'm going to ask you to come boldly up to the front as well because we would love to put our hands on you and agree that Jesus Christ will be made incredibly famous through your lives. So if some of you are saying yes, God, to the invitation, the invitation for you is to dream his dreams. The invitation for you is to walk with him. The invitation for you is to see the world change and lives touched and lives transformed. But most of all, to see Jesus glorified through you. I just want you to come on up to, to the front and say yes to him. Because there's something about saying yes to God that will cause him to take you seriously. There's something about saying yes to him that will cause him to jump over a thousand people just to find you. And there's something about saying yes to him that will cause him to explode in your life. And so Jesus, we ask that you would explode through our lives. We ask that you would take our hands and that you would take our hearts. We ask that you would take our spirits and our souls and that you would make your name incredibly famous through us. And as we're in this place, I just see the Lord beginning to put faces and names before your eyes. Faces of maybe some of your coworkers, faces of some of your family. Hey, and Lord, we ask that you would speak your words through us to them. And we bless you. We bless you, Catch the Fire Boulder, to be full of boldness and full of grace and full of his faith.